Welcome back to the finally finished shop. Um, I have everything down here and uh, all the, all the machinery is down here. It's pretty much in uh, their permanent homes. Uh, I may end up adding some storage around here, maybe moving a few things around here and there. Um, once I get the feel for it, see if I need to move some stuff around ergonomically. But other than that, all the equipment and everything is down here and we can start to play with the lathe again. So just a heads up on some upcoming videos I have. Uh, I'm going to do some stuff that I have from work. It's not going to be on site like a day in life has been. It's going to be some, um, some stuff that I've taken out of some units that I kind of want to show you guys. Just out of, you know, it's just, it's a little bit different than the norm uh, that you usually see out there in refrigeration units and uh, I kind of want to show that stuff to you. I haven't been able to do a whole lot of filming on the job because we've been doing some installs and some buildings that we can't bring a camera in. So once the warm weather hits and start going crazy with some service calls, uh, hopefully I can get some good videos for you. As you can see, it's uh, springtime in New England, which is why I'm wearing a sweatshirt because it's like 40 degrees out. So that makes perfect sense. So uh, once we start getting into really hot weather, I should be able to get you some good videos of that. Also another video that I'm going to do. I'm going to do a quick video, I'm going to redo a review of this book, right here. Um, this is uh, Metalworking Doing It Better, this is by Tom Lipton. Some of you may know him from Ox Tool Co. Um, very good channel, if you haven't checked it out, I recommend you do. This is one of his two books that he has written, and I uh, happened to pick it up and read it. And I'm going to do a quick review on that later on. But what we're going to be talking about in this series of videos is we're going to be talking about how to buy a lathe, uh, what to look for, and how to kind of, you know, check for somewhere, and things like that. Now I know Tom has a, a video series of that out. Um, I'll be honest with you, I haven't watched them because I kind of want to see the difference between uh, what I say and what he says. Obviously, his is more than likely going to be a lot more technical. Uh, he has a lot more knowledge in, than I do, and uh, his will probably be a lot more in depth and uh, a lot more, uh, you get a lot more better a idea of, of uh, accuracy wise of how worn a, you know, a lathe bed it is and stuff like that. But um, this is going to kind of be a basic video of um, different types of lathes, how lathes are classified, how um, different types, different makes, and different things that you can see. I'm also going to kind of point out the difference, which is kind of, kind of um, pertinent to this area of how to kind of pick out uh, an old line shaft lathe from a, perp uh, a bench uh, lathe like this. Um, there are certain things that you want to look for. So those are extremely common around here. I mean, we're pretty much, uh, uh, I'm not that far away from the major industrial centers of, or that were the main industrial centers of Massachusetts, which were uh, Lowell, Lawrence, Lynn, uh, places like that. So there were a lot of those old iron around here. Um, you know, the Merrimack River was pretty much the lifeblood of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and that's where all the mills and all the machine and fabrication came from and started in Massachusetts. Plus, in, in uh, all the surrounding towns of, of there was the Middlesex Canals, which is where they transported the goods from the mills to the outlying towns uh, and cities. So we have a lot of old iron here. Uh, also, it's gonna, this is going to be uh, kind of more for the first time lathe buyer. I mean, I'm going to assume that the person watching this video uh, isn't going to know much about lathes. Um, isn't going to have a lot of, uh, you know, test equipment. I mean, they're not going to have any kind of precision straight edges or precision precision mandrels or anything like that. They're going to be able to use. This is kind of a quick. I see something on Craigslist. I want to go see it. I want to know how worn it is. And it's going to mostly be, you know, um, be pertinent. Well, not pertinent, but um, be geared towards your older um, belt-driven lathes like this. I mean, it, as far as uh, bedware and stuff like that, that, that goes to all lathes, but um, this is going to be more, you know, belt drive with the open gear train. There's not necessarily uh, geared head lathes and stuff like that. There's a whole different other class of lathe. Um, 
And as far, as far as for examples are, we're going to be using uh, a bedware and stuff like that. We're going to be using my lathe, which is a 1950 9-inch uh, self bend. And um, this is a bench lathe. Obviously, you can see it's mounted to a bench. There are also, um, you know, pedestal mountain lathes. Uh, there are under drive mountain lathes, but this is a bench lathe with a separate back counter shaft like this. And uh, this is pretty much going to be our example as we go along. Now, the one thing that I'm not going to talk about very much um, is price of lathes. Price of lathes is subjective upon so many things, such as condition of the lathe, size of the lathe, make of the lathe, how much tooling it comes from, and most importantly, location. My price for a comparable lathe from your area is going to be completely different. Um, like I said, this, is, this Massachusetts was a huge industrial center. New England in general was. There are a lot, there, or there is a lot of old iron floating around out there. So my price is going to be a lot different than say somebody out um, in Arizona. I'm assuming there's not a lot of lays out there because, I mean, it's a desert. So uh, as far as, I'll tell you what I paid for this eventually and show you what it came with, but as far as somebody asking me, oh, they, I, have, I see this lathe, how much would that cost? The prices vary considerably, and even the size of the lathe will, will vary considerably. Anything between, uh, as far as home shop goes, uh, like this, it, anything between 9 and 13 inch, at pretty much the sought after sizes. So those lathes are gonna be more expensive than something that's bigger. It's kind of weird, you would think the opposite, but you'll actually go and look and you'll see anywhere between nine to 13, even sometimes up to 14, 14 inch, um, you'll see those prices be kind of high. Then all of a sudden you start getting into the 16, the 18 inch lathes and the price actually drops. And there's a reason for that, especially with the older lathes, because an older lathe, somebody in say a production shop is not going to buy an older lathe while it's too big for somebody like me in a basement shop to carry that thing down the stairs so size even size of the lathe plays a very very important part in the the price of a lathe now as far as classification of size what's a nine inch lathe what's a 10 inch lathe what's a 16 inch lathe depends on where you're from usually in America, when they say the size of a lathe is a 9 or 10 inch, that indicates the largest piece of stock you can fit in the lathe. So this is a 9 inch lathe, meaning that I can swing a 9 inch piece of stock here without hitting the bed. All right. In other countries, uh, Europe, England I believe also too, somebody could probably correct me on that if I'm wrong, but they're usually indicated um, by the center height. So like a seven inch Myford will be, could, could be referred to as a three and a half inch Myford. Um, but here in America, like I said, generally if you hear a nine inch lathe, that is the largest piece of stock that you can fit in a lathe. Now what that does not indicate is the largest piece of stock that you can swing over the carriage. Obviously your carriage is higher than the bed of your lathe. So you, your actual largest piece of stock that you can effectively get your carriage under is smaller than your swing, okay? So you, you have to be aware of that. They also make a thing called a gap bed lathe, which are usually coming with bigger lathes. And South Bend did have gap bed lathes. Um, they're kind of rare on the South Bends, but basically that would be a chunk of removable way in front of the chuck to be able to spin a larger piece only for a shortened length. Um, if you look at people, look at Keith Fender's lathe. His is a gap bed lathe. Yeah, there's a section that removes um, for to be able to spin a uh, a larger piece in that one little section. Um, but as far as like I said, as far as sizes go. Um, that's, that's generally how they're rated. Also, they're, um, as far as the other way that they're really rated, they're rated by bed length. Now, bed length is the length of the bed 
from the beginning here to the end. There are two measurements that you would want to be concerned with is physical bed length, which in my case is four and a half feet, uh, 54 inches, and then there is center to center. What that is, is the length from your, from if you were to put a center in each, in the, the, the headstock and the tailstock, the longest piece that you can fit on the lathe from center to center. That is obviously going to be smaller than your bed length, which in my case, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what it is. We're going to be guesstimating that roughly because I don't have a center in here, but we'll be doing that. We'll call that, what, about 34 inches in my case. And this is a 54 inch bed, which is the longest, the longest bed they make in a nine inch lathe. Um, I believe they go down from, from three foot, three foot, three and a half foot, four foot, four and a half foot. I believe the bed lengths on the nine inch lathe, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so um, we're gonna, we're gonna, this, this here was a Model B uh, lathe, which means that it had changed gears. I since, since converted it to a Model A, which, um, has a gearbox. So right now we're going to go upstairs on the computer and I'm going to show you some kind of just different uh, general types of lathes that you would probably see that are that are more common than others. Uh, I don't want to say these are the most common lathes out there but they're at least in my area um, they're pretty common and they're probably the ones that you can see most on Craigslist. So we'll go take a look at those and see the differences between them and then we'll kind of come back here and talk about um, what lathe may be right for you. Okay, so we're here on uh, this site here, lathes.co.uk, and I gotta thank Tony for letting me use this site. Um, and we're just gonna, I'm gonna show you a few makes of um, extremely common, common lathes. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but we're just gonna show three or four different types just so you can kind of get an idea of what we're talking about here. So the first one is going to be an Atlas Atlas lathe. Um, these are the small six inch lathes that are kind of common around here. They're very very light and very 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 small um, and for whatever reason they do command a relatively what I think is high price. Um, I mean I've seen them go anywhere between three and seven hundred dollars. Now they're flat ways, unlike the Celpen, which has the V ways on it. And there are pros and cons of each, but on these, basically, you're relying on the Gibbs and everything else. They keep everything in line, whereas on the South Bends, the Vs hold everything together. Also, these lays, even the bigger ones, like the 10 and 12 inch ones, I believe Tubalcane has a 12 inch Craftsman, which is the same thing as the Atlas. Um, they weren't made out of cast iron, they were made out of uh, Zamic, it's Z A. MAK, their own kind of proprietary nickel pot metal. Uh, and the problem with that is, it, depending on how they were stored, they kind of tend to deteriorate. I mean, I, I had a, an old 10 inch um, Craftsman table saw where the rip fence, um, the clamps were made out of that, and they just disintegrated completely. Um, also, these are change gear only. Um, you can't, the, the six inches uh, do not have any kind of gearbox in there, and they're, no, they're not. They're power feed, but power feed by the half nuts only, kind of like a self bend Model C, which we'll get into a little bit later here. Um, well, there's an actual picture of one here. Yeah, here we go. You see these these gears? These are not cast iron. They're kind of like that nickel pot metal. And as you can see here, those are plastic gears. Um, this is just a very very lightweight lathe, but you know they are very very common. They do they are around a lot. And I think they're only 18 inches long or something like that. They're very, very small. Um, so if you have limited space, I mean, it is an option for you. And um, I would gladly take one of these over one of those 7x12s from Harbor Freight. So that, now um, Atlas did make up to uh, bigger lathes, up to 12 inches and something like stuff like that. Here we go. Um, which, like I said, I believe Tubal Cain has, um, I think he has a 12-inch. And I believe his is a Craftsman branded, but it kind of looks like that. And, uh, you know, then you're getting into a heavier lathe um, like that. But uh, the 12 inches, I don't see a lot of. I see a lot of the 10-inch ones. Um, 
which would pretty much look like this. I see a lot of these 10 inch lathes around. Um, they're all they're all V-belt drive, and uh, it's it's a relatively sturdy lathe. They're sturdier than the uh, than the little ones there. Um, but like I said, you still this one happens to be change gear. I think some of them are um, are do have the gearbox on them. And I think this is a, a lead screw reversing lever. I believe that's what that is. So let's take a look at another one here. We're going to look at um, some Logans. And this is kind of comparable to um, the salt bends. Uh, they, they have V-Ways, roughly the same configuration. They can come in the gearbox. They're very, uh, the, the major difference between this and that is um, these have a lever uh, clutch on them and their V-belt drive. They're a little less common than the salt bends. Parts are a little bit harder to find, but um, you, you see these around a lot, and they they um, they like I said comparable uh, to the salt bends in in many ways. Now the salt bend itself, there are very many different models out. We'll look at the workshop nine inches, pretty much with it, what I have. Now there are different workshop versions. Um, when you go talk about the nine A, B, and C, and then the earlier ones like the four hundred fives and things like that. Um, different configurations that they came in. Here's an underdrive mount. Um, the motor and counter shaft are under here. It's all mounted in its own bench. These are a newer, a newer version. Um, you see if they have a uh, yeah. These are the older, older ones like the 405s and stuff like that. And uh, you can kind of see on these that. They have, I don't know if there's an, if there may be an actual, yeah. These here, you can see these are top oilers. They don't have the side oilers and wicks like mine do. And um, they're the open casting on the on the, um, the tailstock. That kind, kind of is the biggest giveaway. Also, these, you can't put a, just slap a gearbox on these because there's a clearance issue on this. Um, you can only do that on the, on the A, B, and C designated um, lathes. And uh, we go up to, let's see, a 10K, which is um, basically a 9-inch lathe with a 10-inch center height. Um, it's got a spindle lock. It's the biggest thing. The biggest way to tell these about these, these apart from the 9-inch lathes, except for uh, besides the swing, because a lot of people manage to um, mix these up, is the 10K, which it doesn't show on this. You usually, yeah, you usually see the gear guards. And also, you see on the tailstock in the back, there is a um, graduated collar uh, on the hand wheel for depth. That's kind of a dead giveaway on a 10K. Then you have a heavy 10, which is, they're very sought after and kind of expensive. This is like, uh, for a lot of people, the ideal home shop lathe because it's, it's, it's very sturdy, yet it's compact and easier to move. Um, and these came in multiple configurations. Here's your uh, bell housing with the peg leg, um, your underdrive mount on the on the on the uh, the cabinet mount there. And there's two different cabinets. They're the ones with the the tubes here, and then there's this type of cabinet here. Um, and they are available in hardened flame bed. And the way you can tell a hardened bed over a regular bed is um, a hardened bed won't have any of the flaking on that which I'll show on my lathe and I'll see if I can find a picture in here also a flame, flame hardened will usually have this little tag on it and also you'll be able to look under the bed and a lot of times you'll see the bluing mark from the flame hardening on the bottom of the bed uh, or the bottom of the ways where I, rather now what, what I mean by the flaking is let me see if any of these show it There's a picture And like I said, I'll show it on mine, but um, where, where was a picture of one? Uh, you can't really see it on that, but I'll, I'll show it on mine, and um, I'll explain more about how to show against a, a, a hardened bed and a non-hardened bed. Now, a very common um, older lathe around me is Seneca Falls Stars and um, these 
Let me show you a way to kind of show um, line shaft equipment. Because that's what these predominantly were at the time. Okay, here's, here's the counter shaft drive. Okay, um, and that hung above the unit. Now, if you see a unit, here's a picture of one, even though it's a wood lathe. Here's a picture of the counter shaft that hung above. Now, if you see, okay, here's good. See this belt? See how it goes up? This went to a shaft that was mounted on, on the ceiling. That shaft, in turn, was driven by a main drive shaft by, like, a steam engine on the old uh, mills and stuff. And that's how they power their lathes. Now, if you see a lathe like this, that has kind of a cobbled up drive on the back like you look and it's made out of angle iron the motors kind of welded it just doesn't fit the lathe itself more than likely that was a line shaft lathe is that a good thing or a bad thing that is up to you um, I've seen these before I've actually went to go see one when I was looking at lathes and it was a pretty sturdy lathe and the only reason why I didn't buy it was because um, just of the age and as you can see there's no um, dials or anything on this to, to, to measure in depth. There's no uh, graduated collars or anything on this. Um, but, I mean, that's kind of one way to uh, take a look at, uh, to differentiate a, a line shaft drive from a regular drive. Now, those are kind of um, your main line, um, you know, belt drive, common lathes. Now, so just for comparison, we're going to take a look at um, we're going to take a look at a watchmaker's lathe, and that's a watchmaker's lathe. Um, basically, it just mounts to a bench and looks kind of like a portable wood lathe, and they would use gravers to turn. Um, their parts. They're all different types, um, but you know, this is just one. And also, again, just for comparison, I'm going to take a look at the clausing lathes. Um, I'm not sure which one he has, but it kind of looks like this, but uh, this is the lathe of uh, Keith Fenner, pretty much. Um, his is a clausing. Also, Tubal Cane has a 12 or 14 inch clausing, a newer one, I'm not exactly sure the model of it. Um, I looked through there, I didn't quite see it, but it was kind of just for comparison. So uh, let's go back downstairs and uh, we'll kind of take a look at some points which you, which you want to consider um, when you make your lathe size and type. Alright, now that you saw a few different types of common lathes, we're going to talk about what kind or what size at least may be right for you. So, what you you want the biggest lathe you can get. Now, that, does that mean that everybody needs a 20-inch lathe? No. But you want to get the biggest lathe that you can, considering your class of work. So, say you want to be, you're, you're a model maker. You make small-scale models, you know, uh, you got ships in, within the, you know, one one three hundred fiftieth to one seven hundred scale or one twenty four scale autos. I think those are common. Those are common scales. You're not going to need something massive. Can you do small work on a large lathe? Yes, you can. It's a little bit harder. It could just by you know, um, you know, you, you, you turn and honk at things to turn tiny things. But you can do it. But do you need something that big? Not really. You could go with a smaller lathe. But generally, you want to get the biggest one you can and comfortable with it and grow in size a little bit. It's, it's easier to do smaller stuff on a bigger lathe. You can't do bigger stuff on a smaller lathe. That, that's, that's the biggest concern. I mean, I, as far as me, the 9-inch lathe is a very good size for me. The reason why I bought this is because I didn't know if I would like it. So I really didn't want to go out there and buy a big honking lathe and then realize, hey, I hate it, now I have to get rid of this thing, and I already trucked it all the way to my house and spent a ton of money doing that. This was big enough for me to do what I thought I wanted to do, and also be able to move it relatively easily. Um, as far as size goes, I mean, it all, it all depends on you. Would I love to have a bigger lathe? Oh, now? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I can honestly say that. The biggest limitation with this lathe for me, not necessarily the physical size of it, is the through hole in the spindle. That's one thing that you have to really, really consider. The through hole in this spindle here is only three, quarter, three quarters of an inch, which 
is a bitch, in all honesty. You go up to a 10 inch, it's, uh, I think it's an inch and a quarter, or inch and a half or something like that. And I think one of them is inch and three quarter. I'm not exactly sure off the top of my head what sizes they are. But having a three quarter inch uh, through hole in the spindle is very limiting. So you have to take into account that. So if I want to cut anything that's over one inch in the lathe and part it off, I have to use a steady rest, which you see me do. It is possible, it just gets to be a pain in the ass here and there. So you want to get the biggest lathe that you can, but you want to also want to consider where you're putting it. You're putting it in your home. If you're putting it in your basement, a 16-inch lathe is going to be a pain in the ass to haul downstairs. You're going to have to take it apart into pieces, and even then, those pieces are going to be heavy as all hell. So you have to take all that into consideration. And, and do your research beyond this, beyond me showing you around the lathe and stuff like that. Just, just you know, do your due diligence out there. And, and look at different different types and different sizes and you know ask people ask people that are doing what you want to get into ask them if they're happy with what they have so like I said th this nine inch one is is a perfect size for me at least um, it's a little bit on the smaller side I would like to have a bigger one um, but for right now this is this is good to go the other biggest consideration too um, is electric electricity Electrical service availability. Okay, this is a single phase, 115 volt single phase lathe. No big deal, plug it into a wall socket. Bigger lathes are gonna have either a 208 volt motor, which really isn't that huge of a thing because you can, usually most 208 volt motors are dual voltage, 115 and 208 single phase. You can you know, switch them around back and forth. The only thing is the higher the voltage, the lower the amperage. So, but, your bigger ones are going to have uh, a three-phase power system. There's just no way around that. Large lathes are going to come three, with a three-phase motor. So you have two options with that. Option number one is you yank out the three-phase motor, put in a single-phase 208 motor, and update, you update the wiring to where you need it to be. Um, just because you're going to have to run uh, probably a, a heavier gauge wire just because you're going to be drawing a decent amount of amperage. Your other options are converters of some sort. There are three types of converters that are out there. You have a rotary phase converter, which is basically an idler motor. Um, I believe Tubalcane has this on his bridge port, if I remember correctly. Um, you have a rotary phase converter, which is basically a motor spinning a generator, which is artificial creating three phase to run your motor. So you're running a motor off of uh, usually 208 and that motor in turn is running your lathe, your lathe motor. Your other option is a static phase converter which is a bunch of capacitors that kind of fake that third leg. With this type of uh, setup you're losing uh, your horsepower rating. I believe it's a, uh, your motor, depending on your converter, your motor will only run two, uh, to two-thirds of the rated horsepower, so you're actually losing, you're, uh, losing horsepower by using that. Your third option, which I do have one, which I'll show you, is this, which is a VFD. This does the same thing just like a static phase converter, but this does it by varying the frequency, the frequency to the motor. Also, by doing that, your motor becomes variable speed. There's a little potentiometer uh, here that will, this will allow you to vary the frequency to your motor, which in turn will vary the speed of your motor. So you basically get a variable speed lathe by using one of these. And depending on the type of they go, they're rated by horsepower. Uh, so this is a three horsepower. This can do up to three horsepower motor, is what this one here can do. Um, I may, uh, we'll probably eventually, depending on if I get, if I can save up enough money to buy a mill of some sort, this may either end up on a mill or end up on this lathe as a three phase. Once you figure out your, size range of your lathe and it's better to have a range not just looking for a specific lathe you're better off having a range of sizes of lathe 
and a few different makes that you could consider. Um, you're ready to start kind of looking on Craigslist. And again, don't turn down anything. I mean, if something pops up that's $200 near you, even if it's one of the brands that you didn't want, what the hell, go for it, it's $200, bucks. what's it gonna waste? So, um, but you're better off, like I said, the, the only, the one and only reason, honestly, why I went with the self bed, the biggest reason, support. There are plenty of forms of owners of these. Um, there are plenty of people that have these out there that are willing to help you. Availability of parts, they're extremely popular, so parts are really, really easy to find. Something breaks on this, I can go out and get it. It's not a big deal. If this was an older lathe, very, very old lathe, or a random make, something breaks on that, I have to make it. So that was kind of one of the reasons why I went with the South Bend, is just because they were well recognized and parts were readily available for it, including things that don't usually come with the lathes, like um, the threading dial, the steady rest, the follower rest, those are all readily available, and also there are new production ones. There's uh, Tools for Jeep uh, makes the steady rest and follower rest of these lathes. So not only can you buy it on a used market, but you can also buy a new one. So, I mean, that's, that's the biggest reason why I went with the self bend. But there are plenty of makes out there um, that, you know, that you, you can and should consider. So, um, once you kind of figure out what you want, your range, what you want to do, what you think you need, and you start looking, um, then we're gonna, the next video, we're gonna start, we're gonna start looking at, um, kind of how to, what you should bring when you see these on Craigslist, and, um, you know, some, some tips on evaluating them, seeing, uh, how worn they are, different things you should check out for, and like I said, it's gonna be specific to the self bed 9 inch, but it can be, um, taking cross-platform to pretty much all lathes, including the geared, a geared head lathe, if that's the way you want to go, um, in so far as the general conditions and uh, the ways and things like that. So, um, you know, hopefully you enjoyed this part of the video, and probably next week we'll start looking at uh, different sections of this. So we'll probably break it down into, um, into three sections. We'll probably break down uh, two, well, at, at least two, maybe three, depending on how long they get. We'll break down um, the the headstock area, the bed itself, um, the gearbox, carriage, and counter shaft, and, and you know what to check for on all of them. And um, hopefully, we can squeeze that out in like two two parts, maybe three. So, uh, see you on the next video. Hopefully, you enjoyed this one.